Okay, so tonight, as I started talking about in worship, do you ever feel tired? You know? I mean, we were going out, we had a staff retreat three days, and just boom, 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 we literally had no breaks. And then had to drive back today, and I was just like, immediately back, immediately get going on um, this afternoon up here, and it's crazy, and I was just like, oh, he's exhausted. I'm exhausted. But I want you guys to think about a few things real quick. Let's think about some things that make us tired. All right? I wrote some stuff down. I want you to tell me if you kind of fit into one of these little categories. So what makes you tired? Let's look the first one up. First one, running or exercise. How many of you get tired of running or exercise? How many of you thinking about running or exercise are tired? You know? Um, it's true. Running and exercise totally can make us get tired. Um, if it doesn't make you tired, do more. All right. Next one. Having to sit and read. How many of you? Come on. Some of you are like, no, I come alive when I read. Some of us are like, we're like, if I need to fall asleep, get the book. I'm good to go, you know? Read through osmosis, right? You know, just knock that stuff out, okay? Next one. Watching something on the TV that, that may be slow. Come on, preacher. What was that word? Say that word louder. Golf. Golf. You want to, I'm sorry, my golf is in the house. You want to snooze? You're, you're like, I feel like I've been asleep. I haven't slept in years. Turn on the golf. <laughs> Seriously, that's about how it goes, right? Don't be like, I mean, you're sitting there going. Seriously, can I just tap out right now? We went over to somebody's house one time, they watching golf, and I was like, okay, if something needs to happen, oh, I'm just going to start to fall asleep on our couch. I mean, something's going to happen. You know, it's always true that. I can't nap unless you turn on light and go. Or some of you, like, the History Channel. You're like, there's a reason it's called History. I'm good. You know? Uh, and said, some of y'all are like, I get so excited. So I was like, see ya. You know? Next one. Not getting enough sleep. You're like, seriously, three hours is not cutting. You're right, three hours is not cutting. But there is a flip flop to that one. How about this one? Sleeping too much. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're like, for some reason, it's Saturday. You went to bed at like 10 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden, Friday night, 10 o'clock, you fall asleep. Saturday at like 12, noon, you're starting to wake up. Yeah, but you're starting to wake up. And you're like, it's not for breakfast or like it's lunchtime. No, it's not yet. But you get up, and like for the rest of that day, you're like, I'm so tired. Because it's true. You get too much sleep, and you will be tired. That's all there is to that. So you can't really win on that one. All right? How about this one? <coughs> Dealing with intense situations. How many of you drama wears you out physically? You know what I'm saying? Like, you're sitting there dealing with people and you're like, dude, I'm done. I gotta go to bed. What's the matter? You were just talking to people, you don't know. I'll bring too much movement. I'm out. You know what I'm saying? Too much drama. All right? That's true. Those things seriously can make you way tired. I mean, this is nothing but like food. Think about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's coming up before too long. And you know, and you start throwing down all that turkey and gravy and stuff and everything else. You know, you're wearing like your fat pants. You know what I'm saying? Like, you never wearing like your belly. I gotta wear some stuff in room. Room to grow. You know? Because you're ready to eat. But afterwards, you're like, you're pulling back, right? Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? You eat so much and you're just like, I'm stuck, I'm like that, they're ready to go hibernate. You know? Um, there's all kinds of things that can make you tired. But what about spiritually? What about spiritually tired? Thought of a couple things with this one too. Throw this one up for me. What makes you tired in your faith? Here's the first one Feeling like it doesn't matter because no one seems to care. Can't that make you tired? Maybe you're the only one in your class as a believer, and you feel like you're constantly trying to defend your faith, and it seems like nobody cares. And maybe it's even worse because there actually are people that say they're Christ followers in that class, but they're not saying they're doing nothing. 
And you're like, am I really fighting this battle by myself? And she tired of it. What about the next one? Doing more than spending time with him. And we get some guilty in the house sometimes, right? We go, go, go for Jesus, but we forget to sit in his presence. Let him speak to us. We forget to have that time with him. And that can make you tired, you know what I'm saying? Like, today we were driving back, and uh, I was like, we were trying to get to exit 745, because that was where Rudy's was. And we were coming from like exit 600 originally. And so we're like, we're going, we're going. And I'm looking down at my gas tank, and it had like that much left in it. And I'm just thinking, ooh, okay, how much is a gallon? Probably that much, so that much have been two gallons. How much can I really go? I thought I had an 18 gallon tank, because I've never, I mean, I've emptied my tank, I thought before, and put like 17 and a half gallons in it, so I'm thinking, okay, probably have an 18, 18.2 gallon tank. Um, I couldn't exit, this one exit, there was no way we were making those 7.45, let me just say. We're about 6.50 something, and my light comes on. I'm thinking, I maxed out, have 30 miles to go, max. And around the 675 mark ish, 680 mark, I see this one turn off, and there's a gas station. And I think about it, and I start to look over, and here comes a nice truck. It's like, I'm going to pull up right next to David, because he might know my name. And then I'm going to block him so he can't exit. And it worked. The guys in the car really didn't know what was going on yet. I'm like, all right. And all of a sudden, Steve, who was behind me, is like, Dave, we started to run on fumes. Uh, that day, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Y'all ready to work out? We might need to be pushing. And I'm just going to think, oh, this is not going to be good. And I almost exited, and I realized, oh, there's no gas station there, so I keep going forward. Barely made it to my 696 exit. I'm coasting in behind this 18 wheeler towards the gas station, and I'm thinking, this brother better keep going. Because if I hit the brakes, this car's probably not going to keep going. You know, and then Larry's got to get out and push. I'm just saying, you know. So it's like, come on. So we finally get over there. I pull in. I realize that I put 18.6 gallons in my car. So I must have a 19 gallon tank. Um, didn't realize that. All I'm saying is, I've never gotten that low on my tank before. I'm like, this is insane. But I say this to say, come back to this. My car eventually was going to stop. And it was probably going to stop pretty quick. And it was semi-coasting into that gas station. And I wanted to keep pushing it because I'm thinking, I can do it. My car can do it. No can't. No can't. Please Lord help. Because at some point I'm going to have to refill my tank. It can do all I want. But if I don't stop and refill it, it will stop out in the middle of nowhere. And that will be that. Kind of like your bodies. You can go, 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 go. But if you don't stop and put energy in, food, water, your body will let you know that it's missing something. Your body will communicate it very clearly to you so you know exactly what I'm talking about. What makes us think spiritually that's any different so you know exactly what I mean? Because you've gone through moments where you are, I'm serving Jesus, I'm serving Jesus, I'm serving Jesus. And you don't like slowly come off that high, you crash. Anybody ever been there? It's like you were like totally on fire for Jesus, you're blazing, and all of a sudden you're just stopped. Right? You're going to coast into the gas station, you know what I'm saying? Anybody ever had that happen to them? I've never had that happen before. It's crazy. Okay? Next one. People coming down on you for your faith. Especially maybe even if it is other Christ followers. Coming down on you for your faith. That can make you tired, because you feel like you just keep taking hits, right? And that's different than the first one, where I feel like it doesn't matter because no one seems to care. Obviously, these people care because they're coming down on you. So they're almost intensifying it for you. And then the final one, the next one. Going through heavy trials. You have so much stuff going on in your life. And you're thinking, how much more? Lord, I know you said that you will not give us more than we can handle, but for real, so I thought that one time, you must say that I'm strong enough, you know? Sometimes we don't think we're that strong. 
But the Lord knows how strong you are. <coughs> gotcha. When you're going through heavy trials, sometimes that can wear you out. True story. Why does this matter? Tonight we're talking about the church in Philadelphia. And when Jesus introduces himself to these people and he gets into it, I want you to catch one thing really loud and clear when I start preaching. He doesn't get on to these people. He doesn't crack on them for their behaviors. He knows that they are worn out. So if you open up to Revelation 3, Revelation 3, starting in verse 7. And I'm probably going to break this up a whole lot, so just kind of be ready. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Let me say that again. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Look at how he calls himself out first. Jesus straight out from the very beginning says, this is the one of the one who is holy and true. Holy, they knew what that meant. We sing that in the song, and we'll say like holy, 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 and all this, whatever. I don't think we really a lot of times can grasp what holy really means. Holy, as in that perfect majesty, that absolute perfection of God. Not one blemish, not one spot, just holy, holy, spotless. But well, we're not. Unless we're hiding behind the cross of Jesus. You follow? He is the one who is holy. There is no one else that is holy in and of themselves. No one. And true. It's holy and true. He is truth. He is the very definition of truth. What he says will be holy, will be perfect, will be without blemish. What he does will be holy, without any marks of imperfection. What he says and does will be absolutely true, right, correct. And I love what he says here. The one who holds the key of David. He's reminding these people because they know their heritage. They know they come from that line of King David because that's where the Messiah came from. And what he's saying is I'm the one that holds the key. In other words, all authority and leadership over the church over the people of faith, not this house, all the houses of faith. All authority and leadership belongs to Jesus. You're going to see why he says that in a minute. But I want you to think about that for a second. Do we try to take that key from him sometimes? Walk with me here. Do we try to turn around and take the key of authority and leadership from Jesus and say, well, that's not how I want to do it. I want it to be like this. Well, what does he want it to be like? That's where the word open up comes back to. What does he want it to be like? He's the one who holds the key. And we need to trust him because he's the one who's holy and true. So we need to follow as he guides. And he's telling these people, I'm the one who holds the key of David. All that authority, that belongs to me. Man, I open doors and no one can shut. If I'm shutting the door, ain't nobody going to open it. I've got the authority. Open and shut whatever door I want to shut. That authority belongs to me. That's what Jesus is saying. And here's why. Go on down to verses 8 through 10. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, but they are not, but are liars. And I'll make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Now I'll catch what he's saying. He's, in the, he's the one that opens the shutter doors. He's the one that's holy and true. And now here he goes, I know your deeds. 
See, I've this before you to open the door and look at show. I said, I'm the one that opened the door for you to even come into my presence. And no one can shut that door. I opened it for you to come in. I know your deeds. And I know that you have little strength. And you've kept my word and you've not denied my name. It's like he's saying, I know y'all are tired. And no doubt. I mean, look, I'll make those who are the synagogue of Satan, I love how they kind of call them like a church, if you will, who claim to be Jews, but they're not, but are liars. They're claiming to be followers. They're claiming to be God's chosen people. But ah, they are lying because they could care less. Those people are surrounding these people in Philadelphia. These ones that are basically, they're your definition of a hypocrite. You know, and y'all heard me say this before. I do not believe the church is full of hypocrites. So the church has a bunch of hypocrites. Absolutely not. Because I am not a hypocrite. I am an absolute sinner. I will call that out. I am a sinner. I have sinned. I still sin and fall short of the glory of God, and I still need His grace to redeem me, and I need to keep my eyes on Jesus so I can try to get as far away from sin as possible. The difference is between a sinner and a hypocrite. Sinner cares, responds to the Spirit. A hypocrite could care less. I'm going to keep living like trash. I don't care what you think. Are there hypocrites in the church? Yeah, seven. But they do not make up the church. They do not. And we seem to let everybody, everybody's like, church will ever, because I know we're, we're hypocrites too. I hope ain't none of you in this house are hypocrite. A hypocrite doesn't care. A sinner does care. A sinner has been saved by grace. They care. The Spirit works in their life. They know. These people have probably been pounded. And so they're probably tired. You think back to that list of things that make you weak and make you tired in the faith. I bet you sometimes some of these people are probably going, is it worth it to keep going? They're going to be down in their faith. They feel like they're the only ones. And talk about timing. And Jesus does say, going, I know. I see you. I got you. I'm aware. And I love what he says. He's just like, I open a door for you that no one can shut. I made the way for you to come to me. And these people, they want to beat you down. These people, they want to whatever you about your faith. Just so you know, your faith is not about those people. Your faith is about me, your Savior, Jesus Christ. They can't shut that door. And a lot of times, y'all, a lot of times, hear me, we surrender. Well, we should never surrender. A lot of times, we let people Make us think, or try to make us think, brother. We let them try to make us think that we have no value in Christ. Yeah, you do. He died for you. There's your value in Christ. He loved you so much that he didn't want to live without you. But we let people beat us down. And some of you are like, yeah, but I've sinned and I've been this. Okay. And? We know who paid for that sin. We know who paid for that sin. So release it to him and quit letting these people take you down. Because I wonder how many of us in our faith back off, surrender to the ways of the world <coughs> because does Jesus really care? I mean, have you ever heard somebody tell you or have you even thought ever I used to go to church, but man, I started doing this and that, and I wouldn't be welcome there anymore. Jesus won't take me back. You ever hear things like that? You ever thought that? Our God is a redeemer. But the world wants us to think. The enemy wants us to think. He's waiting. The enemy is waiting for you to sin. So he can turn around and come in and go, yeah, see, you're kind of worthless, so forget about it. 
Forget about walking with Jesus now, because look what you did. You know, you just gave another reason for him to be on that cross. How dare you? The enemy plays it against us. And we bow down under it sometimes. Isn't that crazy? The enemy comes after us using our own faith against us. And we surrender and love him. And so we cave back. I'm never going to be good enough. Remember last week? I was telling you, it's not about how far down you fall. It's about how you get back up. It's not about how far you fall. It's about how you can get up. How are you going to get up? And sometimes rising up is the hardest thing to do without the better sense. And a lot of church people have made it that way for people. But we ain't going to be that kind of people, right? Not a chance. Because we want people to see the hope. We want people to see that no matter what, he has loved us. And the cool thing is, is those that come against you in your faith, you don't have to get vengeance. Vengeance is only about yourself. You don't have to get revenge or anything like that. They're coming against you for your faith. All you got to say is, I'm sorry, you feel that way. Well, you're one of the loser church people. Yes, I know I'm loved by Christ, you know. In fact, why don't you come hang out with some of my loser church people friends? I'd love you to come see what we're about. Really? You're so stupid. Or maybe, but you know, God did take the wise things of the world and, well, use them actually to shame the wise people, make them look foolish. So, why don't you come see? You know that one day, This is truth. One day, those hypocrites, those people who try to come against your faith, one day they're going to come to you and they're going to say, Wow, you were right. When is that day going to come? See, a lot of us are thinking immediacy. A lot of us are thinking, Sweet, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to give them like a month and then to do that. <laughs> and seniors, some of y'all are like, You've been down that road and you know somebody like will come to you within a month. You know, and maybe within a year or two or three. No. For some of you, it may be years before they come. For some of you, it may not be until we're all free to Jesus. We can see in Revelation 5, all creation in heaven and on earth, and they're, they're going to bow at his feet. And they're not going to say that he's worthy to receive praise and honor. They're going to say, praise and honor to you. They're actually going to get you. Know, they're not going to say he's worthy of it. They're going to get it. That's a fact. They're going to give it to him. I wonder if it's going to be in that moment where all of a sudden they look over and they see that you're getting them to stay. I wonder if that's part of what hell is even about when they get separated away because hell is real. And they know that you're not there with them. Who knows? But there's going to be a day where they're going to acknowledge you were right. But catch me on this. Don't prove them right. Keep striving to live out your faith. Proving that Jesus is the right one. Because that's what it's about. If you make it about you all of a sudden, you're no longer living in the right. Do you follow? It's got to stay about him. Not about us. We've got to stay humble. Because some of us are thinking, sweet, I, I got some names that I cannot wait. Come on, you know too, some of the people that have gotten all over us over the years, and how we're believers, and then get on our last nerve. We can't wait for them to come down on our feet, right? No. Because it's not about us. It's about him. It's about him. And he's saying, one day they will come. You see, you've got to overcome. Go to verse 11. 
I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. I want to back up for a second. Back up to verse 10. My bad. Since you kept my command to endure patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I'm going to, I'm going to bring that back out again. I, forgot to, I want, to, want you guys to know this. Because there's all kinds of stupid trash out there. Um, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. This right here is straight up talking about dealing with tribulation and the rapture. Straight up. There will be a period, and Revelation talks about this. Some of y'all have randomly heard about it. There will be a period of seven years of tribulation that will be intense. <laughs> it will be totally intense. And there are people that say, God is going to take us before the tribulation ever starts. So we'll be free from the tribulation. Totally. Some people say that we're going to go halfway through the tribulation, then God's going to take us, and then the rest of them going to deal with the rest of the tribulation. They call it like mid. Some people say we won't get raptured until after the tribulation. Christ's followers say one of those three things, and they even fight about it. I do know one thing is for sure. Don't go to this verse. One thing is a fact. Whether it is pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trip, I'm on a trip. I don't care which one it is, I'm going. So if I get to go before tribulation hits, and I don't have to face the, t the tribulation, school for me, right? And if we go through three and a half years of tribulation, and then he takes us, so we don't have to face the other three and a half years, <coughs> score for us, because we know what some of that felt like, and we're not going to have to endure the rest of it. Sweet. <coughs> or he waits till the seven is over and then takes us. Okay. Because he's still taking us. I don't know why they fight about which point in time it goes. I know he's going to take me when he is coming back for his own. I'm on that trip. And I don't care which time period it hits. He's got me. And he is just as loving if it's pre, mid, or post. But this I know from right here. I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. At some point, at some point, something is going to happen that's going to test everybody on the earth. Are you going to be all about Jesus or all about you? And by the way, if you're all about somebody else, that's still all about you because what that person's going to do for you. So that's still all about you. Are you all about Jesus? Or are you all about yourself? There will be a moment where Jesus is going to real clearly define that moment. This is it. And I'm going to ask all the world, whose side are you on? But see, because you've lived it out. I'm going to spare you from that test. I don't know which part of the rapture that may be in. Like, whether it's going to come pre-trib, mid, post, whatever. I don't know when that's coming. But I know that if I strive to live my life for him, when I sin, I ask his forgiveness and I repent, I turn towards him. I keep striving to live for him, get to know him more, worshiping him, giving my life, living a life of worship, not just a song, but living a life of worship. The more I do that, the more I live up the life he calls me to live. And he's going to allow me to skip this test because my life will have already told him the answer. And we're saved by grace so that no man can boast, Joe. We are. That's a fact. That's Ephesians 2. That being said, wouldn't it be cool when Jesus walks up? I feel like he's going to just walk in the house. Well, wouldn't it be cool if Jesus just comes and looks at you and he goes, oh, all right, now, come on. And you know you, right? You know you. And if Jesus were to look at you and say, come on, Jordan, I already know, I already know, come on. After you have an accident right there on the spot, right? I'm like, for real. Think about the magnitude of what I'm saying here. 
Because I don't think we really do. For Jesus to look at you and go, I already know. I already know. But Jesus, I'm not worthy. I know, but you, man, you've been, you give me your life and you're trying. You allow my spirit to reign in you. I are. If you know what I felt, yes, I know what you felt. You brought back to that. Well, what I panicked. But just like he said a few churches ago about knowing the hearts and minds, and he knows our spirit. He knows. He knows your true spirit. It is for him or for you. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. We gotta get that in our heads. It's not about what somebody else says about your faith. You alone know where you are. If you put your head down tonight, you alone know. Am I striving to live like Jesus? Or am I not? Am I making excuses for why I'm not? Am I letting him be my excuse? For why I keep trying to live for him? Hello? Making excuses for why I'm not? Or letting him be my excuse for why I am trying to live for him? <coughs> but then, go to verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Those who are victorious, I will make pillars in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. May whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. <coughs> This was written way back in the day. Where is he? He said soon. Here's Bill. To him a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is that's a day. If he was to tell you, I'm going to come December 25th of 2014. I wonder how many of us are going to live like fools until December 24th. And I wonder how many of us would actually go, we got less than two months, we got to get busy. We got people that need to know. I wonder what our first responses would be if he actually told us today. And the only reason we're actually going out and trying to get people to know come to Jesus is because we know there is a deadline. Or is it because our love and our faith in him is that important? And he don't have to tell us what day. I care less what day. Because I want somebody to experience Jesus now. Because for every day somebody's without Jesus, that's another day that they're missing the abundant life, the eternal everlasting life they can have that he wants them to have. The relationship with their creator that he has meant for them to have. And instead, they're still living in the life of who they think they are of themselves. They can live redeemed. He is coming soon. We just don't know what day. But I do know this. Every day that passes is one day closer when he comes back. And that's fact. Because it's another day down the road. All right? But you catch when he makes these people. I love this. He makes them pillars. Pillars. Like beams that hold up the house, y'all. Those who live this out. Mind you, we're talking about people that he knows their deeds and that they're doing good, but what are they? What are they? They're tired, right? Are they tired? I know your deeds, but I know that you're tired. I know you're weary. I know why you are. But you keep going after me. I'm going to make you a pillar, baby. You're going to be what holds up the church. Now catch me here. I've been a part of some churches, and I know some other people in this house have too, but I've been a part of some churches where we see these people act like fools that want to split church, like make the church, these people are going to stay at this church, and these people are going to leave this church because the color of the carpet wasn't the color they chose. And I'm thinking, are you for real? 
Of all the eternal consequential things we can talk about, we're talking about the color of the carpet, and we're gonna, that's where our dividing line is? Really? That's stupid. Let's call that what it is. Ain't nobody like that ready to be a pillar of a church. That's one to just, oh, my feelings are hurt. I'm going to go somewhere else. And we have that happen all the time. You know what? We're going to offend people. We're going to offend people sitting around us. I'm going to offend somebody by what I say sometimes. Okay. And I'm sorry that I do that. If what I said was not correct, then man, I pray you forgive me. If what I said is correct, then you better do it while you're offending. But either way, we're going to offend one another. And if we go run, gee, I wonder how we handle it when Jesus offends us with the truth. Do we just go run? I'm not talking about when there's sin dominating. And hypocrisy is what the church is about or whatever. These are people that they're trying to stay so focused. They keep on trying to do good, even though they feel that pressure and they're just so tired. He's like, you know what? You're persevering. You're persevering for his name's sake. I'm going to make you a pillar. And then I love what he does, man. I think it's verse 12. Come back to verse 12. Yeah. Check it out. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down into heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. He's writing three names on you. He is marking his territory. Not only are you a pillar, he's writing. If somebody came up and wrote on my face, you would see that, right? If they marked me, then you would know. If Jenna came up and put Jenna right here. Okay, that's Jenna's dad right there. See, she marked him. Jenna's dad. You know where I go. You know who has me. You follow? Catch me here. Jesus marks these people. He makes it so obvious. I'm going to write on them my name. They're mine. That synagogue is Satan, that bunch of liars. Those ones that are going to have to come down to your feet one time and recognize that you were actually right. Because you were doing what was right, not being right, you were doing right. They're going to acknowledge it to you that what it was all about Jesus. They're going to notice it's not your name written all over you. It's his. We quit watching American Idol way back. And it started to think over and over, so it's what it is. But you know one thing we did notice every time we watched the record, I don't think that's the top 12. You could usually spot out who the believers were. And what's crazy is, usually of the top 12 for American Idol, usually at least half were Christ, Christ followers. Isn't that crazy? Think about America, and yet half of the top 12 are usually Christ followers. A lot of them actually have their stuff in Christian stores now. Isn't that crazy? Usually Christ followers made it towards the end, even. How crazy is that? But we like to turn around before we ever looked up information about them. We like to do this. We turn on TV. We get down the road with them. All of a sudden, here's the top 12. And we already seen them kind of doing a little tryouts and whatever. Believer. Believer. Because there's something about them. They just shine. I don't know these people. I did not get to walk up and go, do you know Jesus? But it was amazing. Some of their bios, they were very articulate about their faith in Jesus Christ. Very articulate about their faith in Jesus Christ. Don't you want to be that person? Now, when somebody looks at you, they just know. Because Jesus has tagged you. When Jesus tags you, people start to know that you're a believer, that you're a Christ follower. The cool thing is, is you know better than to walk around going, yeah, that's what I see. I'm, I'm, I'm a super Christian. Because you know the only reason he tags you is because you were all about him. Either. So you stay humble and you stay all about him, y'all. I'm going to ask you, what do you do when you get tired? 
What do you do when you get tired? Sleep. Sleep. Go for some rest. Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew to take his yoke upon because his burden is easy. I mean, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I believe that's Matthew 11, I think. Take his yoke upon you. Go to him. He wants you to rest in him. Rest in him. But keep doing the right thing. You don't stop. You don't stop. You don't stop. There's never an excuse. To stop your faith. And the more you come to him, the more you get marked as his, the stronger you become in him. That's what he saw in the church of Philadelphia. Hold on. Hold on. So I want you guys to pray with me. Go by your head. Let me tell you what to pray for. I want you to pray. I before you, I want you to think about, is there an area in your life where you feel tired, spiritually speaking? Is there an area in your life where you feel tired, spiritually speaking? <clears throat> Will you ask God to help you persevere through that? Ask God to have a person to do that. Are there friends of yours that you've seen get tired and almost just want to quit walking in faith? Can you pray for them right now? Can you pray for them?